Now get your scripture out and go to the book of Isaiah. We were here a few weekends ago talking about Isaiah chapter 9, the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And I want to go back to the same book today and open up the, the idea from Isaiah a little bit deeper and apply it to your life right now. One of the important things to do in hearing in the scripture ta- or teaching the word of God or, or reading the word of God is figure out what does this mean to me today. You've got to bring yourself in the story. You've got to figure out what's going on here that I can apply to my time and my space. And that's one of my jobs as a pastor is to share the word of God with you in a way that it makes sense for you today. It's not just what happened to them then. It's what's going on in your world today, presently, in the now moment. Isaiah is a significant writer for us. I would encourage everyone here in this house and online to to read the book of Isaiah, but to have some context and not just read the book and be done with it. There's so much in here because Isaiah is literally an open prophecy book. It's going on even today. Isaiah gave to us the Messianic prophecies, also the promise of the return of the Messiah. So we have both in here the idea of his first and second coming. Isaiah is a prophet of salvation. I want to challenge you today, when you say things getting tough in life, let's start talking more and more about the Great Commission. Let's start talking more and more about people coming to know Jesus Christ. A lot of churches, a lot of believers today, a lot of Bible people are going to get caught up in when's he coming back. And the answer is none of us know, but we know he is coming back. And we need to be ready and we need more people prepared for his return. And that's one of the jobs of the body of Christ. So as difficulty arises around us, as as chaos and calamity begins to form almost every day in a new venture in this life, I want to encourage you to begin to lean deeper and deeper into the Great Commission. And here's what you also have to know. The book of Isaiah is an open book until his return. So when you read the book of Isaiah, you're actually engaging in a promise of his return because everything in here is still developing right in front of us even today. So when Isaiah wrote this book, he had three basic uh, premises in mind. And I gave these to you two weeks ago, but I want to go back to them real fast as a refresher and then lean hard on the third one today. The first was simply this. He was talking to Israel and to Judah about God's displeasure with their sin. Let me say it to you really nice today. God doesn't like sin. He never has. He never will. He doesn't like your sin, my sin, anybody's sin. God does not like sin because sin misses God's mark for your life. And God will judge all sin. We don't have to worry about will he. The answer is he will. The hope we have is how will we align when that judgment comes down. The second thought is this. He wrote this to turn people, God's people away from disobeying in order to stop future calamity. If you study out the life of Israel, they always got in trouble because they kept disobeying God. It's not complicated. When we disobey God, we face difficulty. If we will just do what God has said to do. I told my kids one time, my kids were younger, and they were doing typical boy fighting and just kind of at each other all the time. And and it it was a frustrating day, no doubt. And I told my sons, I said, listen, guys, if you guys will just behave and do what you're told to do, this house will be a whole lot more peaceful and a whole lot more fun. Any parents in the house identify with that conversation? You know, I can almost see God in heaven going, listen, if you guys would just do what you're told to do, if you'll just obey my word, then this life, your life, your family, everything else will be a whole lot more fun because all the God's promises, all God's precepts, all his statutes are there for our benefit, not for our burden. When God says don't, he's not trying to limit you, he's trying to protect you. When God says no, that isn't him being a controlling God. That's him being a loving God. And so Isaiah wrote to say, stop disobeying because you're hurting yourself in the future. And the third purpose of this book, which is our topic today, is simply to lay a foundation of hope and prepare the faithful remnant of God's people. And I want to talk to you for a few moments today about this word remnant. And what does that mean to us today? 
If you've ever bought carpet, you've probably taken a remnant back to your house to get a look at what that would look like in your home, where the carpet guy comes out and brings to your remnants a smaller piece. So what is a remnant in this conversation? How does it apply to us today? Well, let's go to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 9 was the messianic text about wonderful counselor, mighty God. Let's bounce over to the next chapter on the right, and let's go to Isaiah chapter 10, and let's pick it up in verse 20, okay? Get your scripture out. I hope you got your Bible with you today. I encourage you to bring your, your actual physical leather uh, paperback, whatever it may be. I know you say, Marty, my Bible's on my cell phone. Well, yes, so is Amazon, so is Facebook, so is Tic Tac, <laughs> and everything else. Isaiah chapter 10, here we go, verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, the remnant of Israel, and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, now watch this close and see this verse. Will never again depend on him who defeated them. Think about that phrasing there. Will never again depend on him who defeated them. Why would anybody depend on someone who had defeated them in the first place? Let's come back to that in just a second. But will depend, but will depend, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. Verse 22, for though your people, O Israel, be as sands of the sea, a remnant of them will return. Notice this right here, sands of the sea, now down to a smaller group of people, many down to just a few. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. At this time, Israel is in captivity to the Assyrians. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you as in the manner of Egypt, same as Pharaoh did to them. For yet a very little while, and the indignation will cease, as will my anger and their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him, like the slaughter of Midian. This is talking about Gideon's victory over the Midianites. At the rock of Oreb, and his rod was on the sea, so, he will, so will he lift up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that this burden will be taken away from your soul, uh, shoulder and his yoke will from, be from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now here's a big picture for you. Isaiah is talking to Israel simply saying what you've always known is about to come to an end. And he kicks off by talking about this remnant conversation. And so I want to first of all just ask the question, what is a remnant? Well, in simple terms, a remnant is a smaller amount from a larger portion. Notice how it said earlier that you're like the sand of the sea, but you're going to be a remnant. The, the many become the few. Let me help us all today. God does not need quantity. God needs faithful, obedient servants, and God can do anything with someone who's faithful. It's not about how many people are with you. It's as if God is with you. Now, that's all that matters. And if God is with you, who cares who's against you? Don't be upset today if not everyone agrees with what the Bible says. I'm just going to help you today. That doesn't happen anyway. Don't be upset if you're the only person serving God in your marketplace, if you're the only Christ follower in your family. Listen, stay faithful to God. God is faithful to you. Stay obedient. Don't forget this. God does not forget those who obey and trust in him. God is with you. God is on your side. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. No matter how few you may feel like you are, God is mighty indeed today. As we look at this remnant, we see throughout the scripture that God himself places a high value on just a few people. I mean, just think of it this way. With 12 people, he turned the world upside down. Not, not, not thousands, but just 12. With one baby born in the manger, he changed everything. God is not looking to get a popular vote in this life. 
He is not looking for how the millions respond to him. He's looking for the faithful remnant who were obedient to him. And we see this word come on the scene right here in Isaiah chapter 10. And I'm just curious today in this house and those online, if there's anybody here today who would say, Marty, I want to be part of a faithful remnant for my God. It doesn't matter how many folks fall away, I'm going to stay faithful to my God. Christianity is not a popularity contest. It's not about how many folks are on your team. Our world today hinges on the idea of can you get everyone to agree with you. I'm telling you right now, if everyone agrees, you're probably outside the word of God. I know you're going, man, this is awful blunt. Well, listen, it's just the word of God. And we have to unpack this because the remnant is who God's looking to. Don't forget this. God himself is the one that empowers the remnant. Throughout the Bible, God gives this picture of remnants being significant in his plan. For example, Noah and his family, they were a remnant saved from the flood of destruction. What about, what about Lot and his daughters being saved out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Just a few while the rest were put to death, while they were destroyed, just a few came out. I, I, I think about the story of Gideon here. Gideon kicked off with tens of thousands of warriors, and he gets down to 300, and then God says, take the 300, surround the camp with your torches in a pot, and then crack the pot, and all the folks inside will kill each other. See, listen, God does some strange things because God is not looking for the might of men. God operates by the power of the heavenly host. That's how God operates. And so we see this unfold. There was a time in Elijah's life when he was looking at this massive insurgence of this Baal worship and everybody who was going the wrong direction. And and Elijah thought, man, I'm the last guy here who's serving God. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. I've got 7,000 people who have yet to bow to this pagan God. See, God has always placed a value on a remnant conversation. Don't be discouraged today if you feel like you're in the few because you have on your side the Almighty himself. Let's talk about what this looks like today. What does a faithful remnant look like today? I want to break this down in three basic areas, and we're going to pull it out of the story here in Isaiah chapter 10 and look at what he said to Israel and put that back into your life. And the first is this, the faithful remnant is no longer going to depend on earthly kingdoms. Let me put that for you in layman's terms. The faithful remnant is not looking to earthly governments to perpetuate God's plan. It's interesting to me that he says in here in verse 20, he says that the one who oppressed you, you'll no longer depend upon him. Now think about that verbiage there. Why would you ever depend on anybody who had oppressed you in the first place? The Israelites, remember this, they're notorious for coming in and out of slavery. They were slaves in Egypt. And what happened? God delivered them out of Egypt, right? And they're out of Egypt. They're going across the plains of the desert, and they begin to complain. You know why? Because they were hungry. And they begin to complain and murmur, and they begin to talk about wanting to go back to Egypt because of all the good food that they had in Egypt. Think about this mindset. You're prepared to give up your freedom to satisfy your temporal hungers in life. Now, you may not know this, but in this country in America, we are very much leaning into and dependent on government as a, as a nation. Way too many people place their hope in every four years or every two years. And I'm telling you right now, God is still God no matter who's in the White House, who's in the Congress. Doesn't matter to God. He is still God and he is still victorious. And yes, I have my opinions and yes, I have my thoughts, but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. That's all I'm counting on today because everything else is going to come crumbling down. Why? 
why would we depend on earthly government to do the work of God? That's the call of the church. The church is here to lift up his name, to glorify who Jesus is. That's the function of the church. That's what we do. In case you haven't noticed yet, we talk about the kingdom conflict. I've been saying this to you. We actually did a whole series on this called Counterculture. And I kept saying to you that the kingdom of God is in conflict with the kingdoms of men. What am I saying? I'm talking about the government systems. I'm not looking to my government to perpetuate the gospel. I'm not. That's what we do. That's the church's job. In fact, in a perfect world, the church would care for the poor, the sick, the lame, and the widow. We'd feed the the, the hungry, care for the homeless. That's what the church would do. That's the church's job, and the government has stepped in because at some point, we stepped out. It is time we step back in. We be the church in this land. It's time we do what God's called us to do. Let me just give you three areas, and you can, you can look at this, just study out historically. In, in my lifetime, I'm 47 years old, not, not 50. <laughs> in my lifetime, our government in this nation has taken prayer out of schools. Listen, you can work all you want. It's not coming back. You say, man, that sounds so negative. No, it's just real. And you know What? I'd rather have prayer going on in your home. I'd rather have prayer going on in the church. I love prayer. I pray. I think we should pray. I, I thank God anytime we do get prayer in a public setting. But it's, it's been taken out. Um, what about the Bible? Make a middle note of this today. In, in the near future, this book right here will be, disc- be considered hate speech. You know why? Because we want to do things that this Bible says you can't do. Just make a note of it. I'm just helping you. I'm preparing you for this. But you know what? That's okay. Because this is still the eternal, infallible, and errant word of the eternal God. Amen. Call it what you want. But this is God's book. And just this year, we've seen tremendous attempts to even stop worship. Throw out what conversation you want, but I'm telling you it's happened right here in this country. Why are we dependent and hopeful that the kingdoms of men are even necessary for God's kingdom to prevail? Listen, we serve today the eternal king. He is everlasting. He's always been. He will always be. And he is in charge. And he's going to win in the end. And I rest, I rest my case as I rest in his arms. We serve today a good God. And no matter what happens in this life, he is still on the throne. Can I get an amen this morning? He is still a good God. But I think it's unique that Isaiah had to say, listen, the folks who've been beating you, the folks who've been enslaving you, the folks who've been trying to kill you, listen, stop depending on them. He said, start depending just upon God. And my challenge for Calvary Church this coming year as we close out 2020 and go to a new year, my challenge for you is in 2021 and beyond, let's depend upon God. Let's look unto him for everything in life. Number two, quickly, this remnant, listen close, this remnant lives repentant. It says here that they return back in verse 21. The returning idea is a a spiritual term of repentance, returning back to God. And we see it unfolding here for us that stop your sinning, start returning back to me, no longer living in my sin, no no longer living in your sin. The issue is not what pagans do. The issue is when Christians do what pagans do. That's the problem. Pagans do what pagans do. Make sure that we don't do what pagans do. Make sure that we understand the word of God. What does this mean to us? Does it mean we're perfect? Absolutely not. If anybody here is perfect, please get out of here as quick as you can because you're going to mess the rest of us up. We're not perfect, but we are in process. 
We're on a journey becoming more like Christ every day. It's a sanctification process. It happens over time. I should be growing in my walk with God. I should be increasing in my walk with God. I should be getting closer and closer to God. My faith should be stronger. My Bible knowledge should be increasing. Every part of my Christian life should be better than it was last year because I'm growing in process. Sins that got me 20 years ago shouldn't get me today. Sins that got me 10 years ago should not get me today. Sins that got me last year shouldn't get me today. We should always be in the process of growing closer and closer into the image of the Almighty, into the image of God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Look at this in Romans chapter 13, go to verse 11. I love this text, right? Very short, but let's get close. It says, besides this, you know the time. You know the time. That the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. Come on, look back and say, wake up. We cannot keep hitting the snooze. I am guilty of the snooze button. Any other folks in the house, you're part of my snooze club. Put your hand up high. You love to hit that snooze. And I hit it three and four times until my wife gets up and goes, would you please turn that off? Wake up, wake up, Calvary Church, wake up, body of Christ. For salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us, now listen, so then let us cast off the works of darkness. Now just think about this, he's writing this to the church at Rome. This is not the pagans. This is the Christians. This is the Christ followers. He's saying, cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. Look at verse 13. Let us walk properly. Come on, say properly. There is a way that believers should walk every day. Walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Now think about the perspective here. He gives up three basic things. Number one, sexual immorality. That's a category of what he just talked about there. Number two, uh, arguments. And number three, jealousy. I would submit that all three of these are prevalent in the market today. Just pause for a second and think about what you hear about almost every day. At some level, you hear about some form of sexual immorality or perversion in our world today. It's, it's, a, it's a flowing conversation now. Stuff you never heard about 20 years ago is on the tip of everyone's tongue. Folks, that's not because we're getting closer to God. It's because we're getting farther away from God. Then we have this idea of argument. Have you ever seen a culture argue more than, to, than today? Even in the body of Christ? If, if nothing else, we have perfected attacking each other. My goal for 2021 is let's get rid of all the Karens in the world. Let's stop arguing at each other. Let's start helping each other, stop blasting each other, and let's start blessing each other. Let's encourage each other. Listen, this life is tough. Let's be good to each other. Life is difficult. And the third thing we see here is jealousy. We live in a very jealous world today. That's the bedrock of our narrative and the culture today. You want what I have, I want what you have. You want this, I want that. How did he get that? How does she get this? Why don't I have that car? Why don't I have that house? Why didn't I get that for Christmas? That's our world talk today. And all these things are works of the darkness. See, in the light, I'm not jealous of what you have. I celebrate what you have. Because I know God's got me. I'm not worried about what you have. I know this. I'm clothed. I'm fed. I'm sheltered. Everything I need, I have. God's taking good care of me. If you got something different, God bless you and enjoy it. But our world today is bent on being jealous, bent on being in conflict with each other. We love to argue today. I'm telling you, that is a work of the devil. That is not how God operates. Even in the body of Christ, I'm challenging Calvary Church. Let's stop fighting against each other and let's start fighting the gates of hell. Can we do that more efficiently in 2021? You're not my problem. The devil's my problem. I want to attack him, not you. We're on the same team. The enemy is not us. The enemy is the enemy that God tells us who he is. Let's attack him. 
And we see it unfold right here. So what does it mean for us to be this repentant, no longer sinning? It means to be walking and putting on Christ every day. We see in Romans 13, to put on Christ. Verse 14, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Let's put on Jesus. Let's not put on fake the Christian life. Let's clothe ourselves every day with the image of the Son of God. What does it mean to put on Christ? It means to put on this very new nature. The Bible says in Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? He's a new. He's not the old, he's the new. I should be different today since I gave my heart to Christ than I was before I was a believer in Christ. Let's be different. Let's put on Christ every day. You know, we use the picture of water baptism. Baptism is a great example of this because it's, it's a combination of a bath but also a burial. And we could take two looks at this. And, and the burial idea is you go down the old man, come up the brand new man, and when you die to yourself, that guy's gone. Now it's just the new guy. And then we got the picture of what I call it a bath. And have you ever, in the, in, as a parent, ever bathed your kids during the summer after playing outside all day and they come out of the bath water and you're going, Oh my, what is in that? And you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness. It is amazing how much dirt is in there. And you get the ring around the tub. You guys tracking with this conversation? No parent would ever pull their kid out of the dirty bath water, set the kid on a towel, and then take a cup and dip the dirty water and put it back on the kid. But we do that all the time in the Christian life. We want to get baptized, take that bath, and then come back up and then bring that sin back with us. Bring that unbelief back with us. Bring that back. And that's not how this works. If any man be in Christ, he is new. Let's live as people who are new in Christ. Let's put on Christ every day. The imagery here putting on means it's not on there naturally. It's a clothing conversation today. When you get up, you put your clothes on, and we thank you for doing so. It's helping all of our experience today at Calvary Church. Thank you for coming to the house of God clothed today. You go home today, you take something off, maybe get relaxed for the afternoon, maybe tonight go put your pajamas on, tomorrow morning put on something new. You put on Christ every day. Because the day you don't put on Christ is the day you walk in the flesh. The day you walk in your sin. The day you walk in your selfishness. The day you walk in your filthy lust with your own desires. That's the day. So every day you get up, you throw Christ on you. His work upon the cross. You live every day as unto him and you glorify him. To put on Christ means to be a disciple of Christ. Every day growing, I encourage you, bring your Bible with you. We're going to provide for you guys next year notebooks that you can put the sermon notes in every week. And I want you to bring your Bible and bring a notebook because I want you to be taught the Word of God and learn the Word of God. I'll also kick off uh, January with, new, with a Bible study on the Internet every, every morning, early on. We'll do that again. But I want you to get your Scripture out. We've got to learn the Word of God and know how to read the Bible. Be a disciple of this book. This book will change everything. Don't just come to church, hear great music on an average sermon. Come to church and learn the word of God. Because this book will change your life. When a preacher opens his mouth, you open the book. And if it's not in the book, it's just bad pizza. If it's in the book, you better get in line with it. Because this will change your life. To put on Christ means to live in a way that pleases him. What if we lived every day with our only goal being to please him? I just want to please Jesus today. I just want to hear the words at the end of the day. I want to hear the words, well done. I just want to know that everything I did today honored my Father in heaven. I just want to know that today he can look upon me and go, good job. What if next year we lived every day with this mindset of just living every day to the Father? That's how Jesus lived. He just wanted to glorify his Father who was in heaven. And the third thing we see about this remnant is this remnant was expectant. They were looking for this promised Messiah. They were looking for the day that the bondage was gone. They were looking for the day they could walk in freedom once again. And this year I want to challenge you coming up. 
let's live expectant of what God can do. I can't see everything. I don't know many things. And the older I get, the less I know. And the things I do know, I wish I could forget. And then some things I do forget and didn't mean to forget. This is our first year of presence at our house in which we had the wrong presence for the wrong boy. <laughs> because once you close the box and wrap it, you're going, now who was that? <laughs> so we had to, oh, that's your brother. Sorry about that. It happened. 47, it happened. You, you can laugh later on. God will judge you for that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. I want to close out right here. Israel had to learn to trust God when they could not see. Much of our life, we live somewhat blind. That's why we got to look at this book every day. Much of what goes on, we're, we're blind to. We can't see behind the veil. There's a veil. There's a facade. There's a whole other world going on around us even right now. There's a spiritual world. There's a geopolitical world. There's all kinds of things we can't even see as people today. And I want to encourage you, let's trust in God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, We're foreseeing, we're, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us. And let's run with endurance the patience, the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, he despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the Father throne in heaven. When we look at this life today, don't forget that right now in this very moment, there are patriarchs and matriarchs of our faith in heaven today cheering for you. They're looking down going, you can do it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all going, come on guys, don't give up. Samson, Gideon, they're all saying, you got this. Come on, keep pressing through. You're going to make it. God's good. He's faithful. The scripture's full of examples of people, Ruth and so forth, Esther, so many folks that God used to make a difference in this life. And right now today, they are cheering for me and for you. And they're saying, don't lose heart. Don't give up. God's in control. You're going to make it. Keep on pressing forward. Keep trusting God. Keep believing. Keep leaning in closer and closer. Trust his word. Obey his statutes. He's a good God. He's going to help you. And they're cheering for you today. There's so much I cannot say see, but I know this, they can see me, and they're cheering for me right now. They're cheering for you today. This great cloud of those who've gone before, for some of you, it's family. For some of you, it's friends. It's people of faith who've gone before you that right very now in this moment, they're in God's presence, and they're pulling for you to survive today. I want to encourage you, don't give up hope today. Don't lose heart today. When you cannot see what's happening next, that's when you and I have to trust God even more. I don't know what 2021 holds. I had a great guess for 2020 and I was bad wrong. I told someone I came to this great church the first of this year, I was shot out of a can of expectation right smack in the brick wall. It was amazing. You should do that once in a lifetime. But I know this, I know God's still good. I know God's loving, and I know God's faithful. And whatever transpires, I know we're going to be okay because of the God that we serve today. I want to close out by reading you Psalm chapter 20. In fact, I want to have you get on your feet today. And I'm going to read the first part of this, Psalm 20. And then we're going to read chapter, verses 6, 7, and 8, and 9 together out loud like a proclamation. So if you have your Bible, go to Psalm chapter 20. We'll put the words on the screen behind me. You guys get those words up real fast. And then we're going to break into a song of worship, okay? So listen close. I'm going to set this up for you. And then when we hit verse 6, I want you to proclaim it like your life depends upon it. Here we go. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May he remember all your gifts and look favorable upon your burnt offerings. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. This is, a, this is a great text for 2020 coming up. 21. 
May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Who would like to have God answer your prayers in 2021 coming up? All right, now this next part, I want you to I want you to proclaim it like your life depends upon it. Read this for you out loud personally. Claim this, own this, let's declare it, and then let's worship God, okay? Here we go. On the count of three, verse six, one, two, three. Now I know that the Lord rescues his anointed king. He will answer him from his holy heaven and rescue him by his great power. Some nations boast in their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Those nations will fall down and collapse, but we will rise up and stand forever. Give victory to our King. Oh Lord, answer our cry for help. Let's worship God today. Come on, lift your voice. Day was silent, but surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? And Friday's disappointment, this Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling.
Oh man, we serve a God that makes dead things come back to life. I don't know what, what died in your life in 2020. It's been a rough year for so many of us in so many different ways. But listen, I'm believing that 2021 is a year of the rattling. Come on now. That we hear some things coming back to life. Your family, your church, your finances, your health. I'm believing for some rattling around me. If you hear some clanging somewhere, don't be nervous. That's just dead things coming back to life. Dead marriages, dead finances. That's the kind of God that we serve. I'm excited. God is a good and a loving and a faithful God today. Come on, say God is good. Come on, say God is loving. Come on, say God is faithful. We serve a good God today. Dead things coming back to life. I think about the lyric there, just as the man was thrown in the bones of Elijah. You know, that was a promise that God had given him. God's promises don't die. They may be under the dirt, but you throw something on God's promise, it comes back to life because that's the kind of God that we serve today. I don't know who's watching the service or in the house, but if you're here today and you would say, Marty, I, I need to give my heart to Christ. I've not been living like I need to live. I need to make him Lord of my life today. I wanna end this year by knowing that I'm setting my life right with God. I wanna give you a chance to do that right today in this very room. Maybe you're here in person or maybe you're watching online, but I wanna give you a moment because really all we've done today is just about this time right here. The church's greatest purpose is leading people to Christ. That's why the church exists today. So if you're here and you say, man, that's me, I need to give my heart to God today. I need to give my life to Christ today. I'm gonna to count the three and I want you to shoot a hand as high as you can. Don't be shamed, don't be, don't be scared, don't be nervous. We're cheering for you, we love you in this house, and we're on your side today. When I hit three, just put your hand as high as you can because I wanna pray with you. One, two, three, hand up real fast. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. Anybody else, there's five. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's six, or seven. Anybody else today? There's eight, there's nine. Anybody else today? There's 10, there's 11, there's 12, there's 13, there's 14, anybody else today? There's 15, anybody else? 16, 17, 18, 19, anybody else today? Anybody else today? Anybody else? There's 20 right here. Come on, let's just thank God today. 20 hands that I can see today in this place. Let me tell you this, Christmas Eve week, or Christmas Eve service, over 50 hands went up across the house Christmas Eve. We're gonna pray with you today. If your hand was up, I want you to know that we, we love you, we're cheering for you, and we are excited for what God's going to do in your life today. I'm going to say a very little prayer of faith with you. You're going to repeat after me. We'll all pray together. If you're online, I cannot see your hand, but God can see your hand. Put your hand up and say, God, I want to give my heart to Christ today, and repeat this prayer, okay? Y'all ready to pray? Say yes. Come on, say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And today I announce you as the risen son of God, my savior and my Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Come on, big hand for God's saving grace today. If you said that prayer today, whether you're in the house or online, there's a number on the screen right now. Text that number. We want to connect with you, not to harass you or to market you, but just simply make sure that we can pray with you, make sure you have a Bible, make sure you know what is the next step for you to follow Christ, and make sure we give the opportunity to ask any questions you may have. We're here to serve you as a local church and be a blessing in your life. We know God has great things ahead for you today. Come on, one more hand for every person that gave their heart to Christ, not just this weekend, but this week at Calvary Church. We thank God for that. Don't miss next week and coming up. We're going to talk about 2021, all the good things that are going to happen at Calvary Church, how we're going to preach the gospel even with more fervor, our revival time coming up, our prayer service, our devotionals. We're going to do all we can to get the word of God into you at Calvary Church, okay? Can I bless you guys and get you home? That'd be okay to do that today. Put your hand up high. May the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his love surround you. May his grace flow through you. And may you be a faithful, obedient part of his remnant on the earth today. God bless you. I love you. If I don't see you again, happy new year. Take your seat in the house. Been a great crowd.